Right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, being an expedition artist. As Arlene very kindly said, everybody's been so great here at the Maritime Museum. Um, my husband and I, before we had our daughter, we used to come here a lot, actually, because um, we had friends that had a boat in the marina. And so it's just such a joy for me, so thrilling to be able to show here. We're still getting some feedback. <coughs> better if I'm over here? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's do that then. I'm going to bring my equipment. It's very laborious. Bring my equipment over here. No, I'm good. I'm just going to place it. So, uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk a bit about being an expedition artist. So I'm going to talk about, um, primarily about my most recent expedition, which was to the Arctic. Um, and the first two, I've been on three international sailing expeditions. The first two um, I'm going to cover um, sort of reasonably briefly, but since my mind was completely warped by the Arctic, I'm going to spend mo the most time on that. But I'm happy to give you all information about, like I said, anything. All right, so my work, as you can see, hopefully well, you've had... Just a little bit. You bumped the projector. I bumped the projector. Shocking. What's that? Perfect. <laughs> we aim for perfection. We do, actually. Um, hopefully you've had a chance to look at the, at the show. Uh, I do, as Arlene Bray uh, kindly said, I, my work is sometimes extremely accurate and realistic and faithful to the real world. Um, and sometimes it is more abstract, like some of these. Um, so, for example, I painted the official portrait of General Sir Peter de la Villiers um, that hangs in the Naval and Military Club in St. James in central London. Uh, he led the, um, how's my body? It seems like it's going in and out. Okay. Um, he led the British forces in the first Gulf War. He also led the British forces in the Falklands. Um, and he was also the head of the SAS. Um, so it's that kind of super precision, um, which I do. And then I also will kind of pendulum over to super abstract. So I hope that when you look at the work, I hope that you look at it knowing that. Because I think it's important knowing that it's, um, it's uh, what am I trying to say? It's super accurate. It's done on purpose. Everything is for a reason. Um, it's formal, so uh, people would describe it, people in the art world would describe it as formal, so it's about the lines, it's about the shapes, it's about the colors, and it's about the textures. In other words, it's not a narrative, right? It's not biblical. It's not purely abstract. It's not any of these other sort of genres. So people, when they talk about it, they tend to talk about it as being formal. In, in, in other words, it's not like tuxedo formal, it's like shapes, like forms. Normally um, on expeditions, this is the kind of work that I would produce, or as you have seen in the <coughs> exhibition, uh, the kind of work that I would produce. So I'll take uh, relatively normal <coughs> scenes of water and abstract them. Because what I want at the end of the day, what I really want is for everybody to look at water closer. Now you probably all do that because you live here and you have an affinity with water. Many of you are sailors, but not everybody is. So that's what that's my goal in life is to get people to really look. Now let's talk about the expeditions. The first expedition was the Borbador ship expedition. Now this. It, um, is the Borbador ship, named after the Borbador Temple in central Java. And the Borbador Temple, has, have any of you been there? Yes! You get 10 points. Um, that is the largest uh, monument in the southern hemisphere, and it is also the largest stupa temple in the world. The stupa temples are the ones with the heads. And in the middle, because it's stages of enlightenment, right? So in the middle is ordinary life, whatever that means. 
And there are these four stone relief carvings of this wacky boat. It has a hull and it has galleries on either side and then it has outriggers on either side, so double outriggers. And then you can see it has these wacky masts that are um, biped, I guess you would call that. Biped? Okay, so I'm going to break something. It can be Latin rigged or it can be square rigged. It's currently in the Borbador Temple complex in central Java. And now the expedition, why did we build this boat? Well, we built it because um, <coughs> there are, so here's Africa, there are cultural traits. There are cultural traits. Can you even see that? It's not where I was Okay, never mind. <laughs> There are cultural shape shared between West Africa and Indonesia. So how in the heck did that happen? We know that the Indonesians settled northern Madagascar. That's been proven. But how did all that cultural stuff like bananas and other yarrow and other really important cultural things get over there? It could be that they came here and then they told two friends and 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 they told, friends and they told. It, or it could be that they sailed around the Cape as you know some of the most treacherous waters in the world. <coughs> so we set out to prove that a ship of that design from the 8th century, did I forget to mention that? The 8th century could have made that ship, that voyage. So we did that in 2003-2004 um, it was built near um, Bali, which is east of Java. This is the island of Java. This, did I admit you're going to get a little bit of geography, a little bit of history, a little <coughs> bit of culture, hopefully some jokes. <laughs> a little bit of everything. Um, so we sailed from uh, Indonesia to Seychelles to Madagascar um, to Cape Town. Of course, we had to make several stops. Um, briefly stopped at St. Helena, said hello to Napoleon, and then um, finished in Accra. In <coughs> and it took seven months, which was pretty good going, actually. A week, this was the longest leg because we had to wait for good weather to get around the Cape because it was so dangerous. And as it was, um, we blew out uh, a sail. Due to stupidity, probably. <clears throat> so we call that living history, right? So we're reenacting something that we think happened in order to prove that it could have happened. This is one of my paintings of the ship. You get an idea of the galleries and the outriggers there. So what is an exhibition artist? Dipped our toe in. Now, what is an expedition artist? I like to say that an expedition artist is somebody with really good concentration skills. <laughs> a very good musician. <laughs> and I can just tune it out. Um, so, this is me in Syria. No, it isn't either. Uh, yes, this is. This is me in Syria. Um, uh, expedition artist, what I do is I go on these international sailing expeditions to document the expedition, to document what we've seen with more than just photography. Now the reason is because you can get into the psyche a little bit more, you can promote the expedition a little bit more, you can see things, you can talk to people in a nuanced way. You can also make points that, by editing the imagery uh, through painting um, and also photography, I also take photographs in a way that's unique. So in other words, rather than sort of snap, 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 you're actually, oh, I'm going to do a sketch of you on the vessel doing whatever crew job that you are doing. Right? Does that make sense? I am painting all of the oceans on the planet. I have one more to go, which is the Southern Ocean, the Antarctic, and I hope to be the first person to have ever done this. <coughs> Got a couple of grants out there. <clears throat> Gotta get to the Antarctic. <laughs> How many of you have been to the Antarctic? 
It's ridiculously expensive. Yeah. <laughs> oh, brother. Because it's hard. All right. So that's the first expedition. That's the Borbador ship expedition, 8th century Indonesian vessel. I should mention that it was approved by UNESCO, um, the Indonesian Ministry of Culture also. And one of the super coolest things from this expedition is that because of the expedition, Indonesians started uh, teaching about it in their schools. Like so many countries in the world, they um, are super interested in the future and becoming more modern and less interested about in their own history. So that is pretty magical that that happened. Next expedition actually goes back in time. This is Phoenicia. Phoenicia sailed, uh, Borbador sailed 16,000 miles, Phoenicia sailed 20,000 miles, and took two years, actually two years and two months, to circumnavigate Africa. The journey was followed by another voyage to the UK in 2012 for the Olympics and the Queen's Jubilee. Why? Why did we build this ship? So this is a 6th century BC vessel. Um, 2,500 year old, so a replica, 2,500 year old, based on the Jules Verne 7 shipwreck, which is, uh, which is near Marseille, um, on the Mediterranean. And Herodotus, actually, how did I say it here? Herodotus said that the Phoenicians were the first people to round the Cape of Good Hope. And he said this about 100 years after they did it, which is pretty recent pretty close to the time that they would have done it. Um, the Europeans said it was probably Vasco da Gama or some other Portuguese explorer 2,000 years later. So that's a significant discrepancy. And so we, we, proved, we set out to prove that uh, that ship of this design from the 6th century BC could have made that voyage. Again, it's living history. It was conceived by Philip Beale, both of the expeditions, these two expeditions were conceived by Philip Beale. He had the amazing idea to uh, put these projects together, to have the boats built, um, completely masterminded by him, just a, a guy, right? Not a huge organization, something like the Welcome Trust or something, just a man uh, We started out in Syria, had the boat built in Syria, um, and of course we helped. <laughs> significantly, uh, then sailed to Port Said, Port Sudan, um, Yemen, Aden, Oman, Comoros Islands, Mozambique, um, a couple of different places in South Africa, visited some places that we had visited previously with the Borbador ship expedition, St. Helena, the Azores, so going almost all the way to North America, Gibraltar, and then back into Gibraltar, <coughs> Tunisia, Malta, Lebanon, and then finally back to Syria. As expedition artist, what I would do is I would go on a leg, fly back home, work, and work up the work in my studio, come back, go on another leg, go back to my studio, and so forth. Any questions so far? Yes. Did you take photographs to take back with you? I took Wonderful segue. <laughs> yes, I took a lot of photographs. I also made a lot of sketches. I brought four, ske four sketchbooks here for you. Um, if you could just keep my silly little bits of paper in here. I'll pass these around. These are, that one is from the Phoenicia. This is one of my everyday sketchbooks with all kinds of stuff. How many prove it? There are about 12. Skeleton crew, when we sailed um, Phoenicia to London, uh, was about six, I think. And you're saying that you think we built the ship. So you were part of the, the creation of these things? Yeah, so, we, so Philip Beale hired a shipwright in each case, um, and also a ship designer. Um, and whose name will come to me in just a second, um, who was an expert actually in tall ships. Um, and he lives in Australia. And um, so they built them, but it's all hands on deck. 
So we're sewing and we're, uh, you know, mashing um, pine resin in between planks and we're, you know, doing lots of stuff. So that's why I say we, because there was a lot of sweat. <laughs> what is Syria? Oh, well, they still have the boat building tradition. They're, it's, built it, it's in the Mediterranean. Yeah, it's built by hand. It's in the Mediterranean. They are, that's where the Phoenicians were, you know. Um, it makes perfect sense. Because a lot of the other areas where the Phoenicians were no longer have that boat building tradition. Yes. Tell us a little bit about your route. It's not particularly a safe uh, route these days in the years that you sailed there. Did you have somebody along with you for protection? That's an excellent, excellent question. So um, you're right. Um, uh, there were certain segments, um, for example, around Somalia, where there are a lot of pirates. And there were no American passports allowed in that section. Um, the ship also had, I forget the technical term for it, but it's a, a, a directional, um, uh, oral directional, like, blaster thing. So, in other words, it blasts sound at somebody very far away. So there's no, there were no guns on board, nothing like that. Um, but what we could do, or what the captain could do, is actually direct this sound, and it would hurt a lot. The bad guys, or the ships that were getting too close, that weren't, weren't responding to radio communication. Yeah. Um, how did you power this boat? Because I imagine that the Phoenicians had manpower. They had rowers, slaves doing it. So what did you do? Yeah, they did. They did have slaves. Um, we think, right? We, we scientists <laughs> think. Um, we made the oars, and but we didn't have any slaves, which is good um, for me because I probably would have been definitely would have been one of them. Um, we use sail power. Um, we use sail power mainly uh, for some of the smaller marinas and and areas like that. We had a small motor for moving it around. Um, yeah. Did you have electricity? Generally? We did. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Yeah. What was the dimensions of the ship? Oh, good question. Um, they were both about 18, 19 meters, so about 65 feet. So there, here's the Phoenicia being built in Syria. Um, it was built using Aleppo pine. 8,000 olive wood tenons and 16,000 pegs um, and iron nails, according to the, the jewels were in seven. So the way that that would work is you would have your planks like this, and then you would have your tenons going through. So kind of like biscuit joining, right? You would have um, the tenon going through that one and through that one, same one. And then you'd have a peg there and a peg there. Does that make sense? I can draw it. <laughs> and um, this is the actual harbor. You can just make out, maybe not in this photo, I think back here, you can actually make out a little bit of Phoenician wall, which is pretty magical. There's still some remnants of the Phoenicians. This is what I take with me. So actually, this is one of the sketchbooks that I've passed around. Actually, these are two of the sketchbooks that i passed around. I take a very simple kit. Um, Abby's taken a class of mine, so she knows it's the same Tupperware and the same basic colors <coughs> that I take. Um, the coffee <laughs> was extra. Uh, very, very nice people would come out at, when I, I'd go out at sort of 5 or 6 in the morning and start painting. And people were so, so kind. I think they felt sorry for the, the weirdo out there um, <laughs> sketching and would bring me the most gorgeous cups of coffee. And that's it. That's all I take. Apart from canvas, which I would have you know, somewhere else. All acrylic? All paint. All oil paint. Yeah, all oil paint. Uh, I, I 
occasionally teach a workshop on how to paint oils for expeditions. You don't have to have all the chemicals and all the stuff. There's actually a pretty easy way. And the sketches in those books are oil paint as well, by the way. All right, a little bit about life on board. Cleaning and laundry. So it was pretty basic. Um, this is Dierman, who was our carpenter. He was actually uh, Indonesian from the first expedition, but he was so amazing that we had him come back on the second expedition. And um, so what we would do is we would have two buckets. We'd have one bucket of salt water, and then we'd have another bucket of um, non-salt water. Well, actually, with also salt water, but with a little bit of um, the British equivalent to pine salt in there. So we put our dishes in there, we rinse them in the salt water, put the salt water over the side, and then rinse them in the pine salt water. So what that meant is that all of our food tasted a little bit salty and a little bit of pine salt. <laughs> Which is kind of nice. <laughs> they should serve it in restaurants. <laughs> and this is the head. So you climb over the side of the ship, over that little flappy thing. There was canvas to put over you if you wanted. Um, half of the crew uh, were Western and half of the crew were from Indonesia, so there was certainly a lot of respect for the females. Now, I must say that that only comes up to here, <laughs> which is fine if you're a guy. Because <laughs> that's where you would shower as well. You just take buckets of water and, and pour it over your head, right? It's pretty basic. Um, this is where I learned the difference between yaw, pitch, tilt, and roll. <laughs> when you're in the head. <laughs> that's what I would think of. Yaw. Okay. Pitch, tilt, roll. Okay. All right, hold on. Okay, sharks. No, no, no. Yaw. <laughs> this is what it looks like inside. That's it. That's the entire head. <laughs> That's the Phoenicia ship expedition. <laughs> How many women were on the ship? Um, on the Phoenicia, there were two or three, including myself. Yeah. <laughs> and was that part of the um, and I authentic, um, reproduction of what the... Well, we don't really know about the tops of the vessels, right? So when they sink to the bottom of the sea, the bottom gets preserved because it gets covered in sand and shells and whatnot. But the tops get whatever, they float away or whatever. Um, so I don't think anybody really knows what the tops were like. Um, now on to something that's slightly different. The Arctic. So I uh, went to the Arctic as part of my goal to paint all of the oceans on the planet. Now, this was very different. This was not a historical recreation. This was an uh, artist residency, or I should say a residency, involving artists and scientists and one architect. Um, and the idea was to throw a bunch of artists and a bunch of scientists together on a vessel in the Arctic so that they could talk about climatic conditions and climate change and whatever other pithy things they might get up to. Yes? Was part of your goal to research, if I have it correctly, wasn't there a great big glacier that broke off that's the side of Rhode Island, or do I have it wrong? That's in the Antarctic. Yeah. Yes, and the, actually um, the uh, British are going to be sending out an expeditionary crew to, to okay. study okay. that in 2018, but yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, so we sailed to, well we flew to Svalbard, I'll show you where that is in a second north of Norway, and we sailed up the west coast. We sailed nearly to 80 degrees north, which is where the polar ice cap sits. So we got just about to where that polar ice cap sits. Um, just below, which is just below the permanent ice that covers the North Pole, or permanent, whatever that means <laughs> anyway. Um, and I was there in October. October is the absolute best time because 
it's right before all the ice and snows have started to form again, so you can get the furthest north. It's also the most exciting, I think, from a light perspective. Yeah. Now, how big was this ship? Is this uh, what you'd call a tall ship because of the three masts? Well, somebody else here would know better than I. It's technically a three-masted barbantine, so I don't think it would be considered a tall ship. This is giant and super modern by comparison. It's 95 feet long, which to me it was like a Rolls Royce. Because <laughs> some of the other people, they were like, oh, oh, we can't flush the toilet or whatever. It's like, there's a toilet! <laughs>
receding glaciers. So I, I can't tell, you know, I'm a tourist, right? I'm in these places, I'm having the time of my life. And, but I asked the captain and the crew, you know, what, what's different? And they said, five years ago, that wasn't there. And they said, five years ago, that island wasn't there. In other words, it had been covered by ice before. Probably hasn't been revealed, they told me, for 10,000 years. Then there are land glaciers. So you can get right up to a land glacier. I love the idea that the sand in these land glaciers is thousands of years old. Thousands of years old. So you're actually watching the mountains, or I should, yeah, mountains, get carved in real time. Here's an example. So they're super pointy because they're getting carved in real time. It's not like Yosemite where they're like all round and mellowed out, right? They're like actually, it's actually happening before your eyes. It's incredible. Um, now I want to spend a little bit of time talking about Mother Nature's tricks. Because remember I said that my mind was sort of blown by this. I mean, I've traveled a little bit. Um, and so I wasn't expecting to be as surprised as I was, which is a nice thing. I even read a couple of books about the Arctic. I always do that. Do you guys do that before you go someplace where you go and books about it? Yeah. So I was like, oh, yes, well, I read a couple of books. And then I got there, and, and uh, I was very surprised. So first, let's talk about light, famously. Mother Nature's tricks. So I think of us as being Middle Earthers, right? Because we sort of live in this little band. But there's a, and then, but when you get up here or down here, it's, completely different. Um, so, for example, in October, the sun doesn't rise above the horizon starting around October 21st. That doesn't mean it's black. It just means that the sun doesn't rise above the horizon. So you just have this kind of glow. So, in the beginning of October, it starts out like this. It's pretty good. Pretty normal. Sun rises at 9 or 10 or something like that, <coughs> sets it around 6 or something. It's pretty reasonable. Then you lose about 20 minutes of light per day, and then this is noon. Then a few days later, this is noon. <laughs> it just picks off the little peaks of the mountains, which I love. It's stunning. until this is 11 a.m. This is sunrise, <laughs> which is really something, isn't it? This is in Longyearbyen. Longyearbyen was named after a guy named Longyear, an American named Longyear, who uh, thought he would go to the Arctic and uh, dig for coal and make his fortune. And so the town is named, named after him. This is longer than as well. That's the biggest city. It's about, I think it's about 1,600 people at its week. So it's a pretty big town. Um, right, so then there's polar twilight. From November 14th to January 29th, there's no light at all. So you can bet your bottom dollar that January 29th or 30th, they have a big party. <laughs> Actually, I'd love to overwinter there sometime. I think that would be fantastic. It would be really great. Mother Nature's tricks. So that was the sun. Now let's talk about the moon for a minute. You know, like I said, I thought I was all knowledgeable because I read a couple of books. I sort of failed to learn that the moon would be weird as well. Of course the moon would be weird, right? The sun is weird. Why wouldn't the moon be weird? I would get back, so we would go out during the day, we'd go on these hikes and do sketching and take photographs and set up different art projects and scientific things. And then we'd come back and look at all your stuff and sketch and, and this kind of thing. And I noticed that the moon was in every single one of my photos. And I couldn't figure out why. Like, why is the moon like 
thank you. Like, yeah, photo bomb, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, turns out that when the sun disappears, the moon does this little oval thing. It just kind of hangs out around the rim so that the moon is always there. There it is. Or a ray <laughs> So actually, this uh, photograph was taken with my phone because I just couldn't get my camera to take it. But um, little, so the aurora borealis. Now, who here can explain what it is? Oh, come on. Yes, thank you. The sun, the sun's uh, energy is emanating from the earth, and it grows depending on what chemical it is. The electricity that it generates makes it glow like a neon light. Okay. All right. Yeah, it heats up. Good job, Mikey. Yeah, it heats up all those little electrons, right? And all the gases interact with the electrons and they fire off. Something like that. Yeah. So, little story. We're on the boat. We're sailing north. And it had been cloudy, cloudy, cloudy. So after about four days, finally, it was a cloudy at night. And everybody was getting really excited. Okay, we're going to see... The Aurora Borealis. Okay, we're going to take turns because at night, of course, it's really cold. So you have to um, put on the thing, and then you have to put on the balaclava, and then you have to put on the other thing, and the earphones, and then the thing, and the three pairs of pants, and the three gloves, and, 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 and then you're like the Michelin Man. So by the time you're like the Michelin Man, it's your turn to go outside. So you go outside, and then you're supposed to operate a camera on you. Know, and you get out there, and you're holding, of course, you know, one hand for you, one hand for the ship. And you're trying to, uh, you know, find the Aurora Borealis, and you can't find it, and then you go back in, and, and then it's somebody else's turn an hour later. So I think I think the captain thought we were really funny. <laughs> I think he probably thought everybody on his boat was really funny. Uh, so he comes down after a day of this, and he says, Ah, oh, he goes, No, Lord Boy, I was. Like, what? what? Why? Why? He goes, Too far north. <laughs> I can't. I just can't do. I can't do, cap, I can't do captain's accents. <laughs> uh, so it turns out that so here's the Earth, and the aurora borealis is a ring, right? It's a ring. We know that ring of fire, or whatever. In the middle, <laughs> there's you can't see it. It's too far away. But you know we're we're. Not very clever middle earthers, so we just assume that, that you can see it. So we actually had to sail back down to the southern part of the trip before we could see the Aurora Borealis. Turns out you could probably see it a lot better from someplace like Oslo, which is really far south. So to get to this place, you, you fly to Oslo, right in Norway, then you fly to the very north of Norway, and then you fly for three more hours. And then you get on the boat and go up A little bit about the history. Human exploration and exploitation in Svalbard. So it's very different from the Alaska side, right? Um, of, the, of the Arctic. In so far as it doesn't have a big ancient human habitation. Not a lot of people there. There's some dispute about whether there were people there at all, actually, in ancient times. The first time that uh, people came um, in any real numbers was in the 17th century to go whaling. And they hunted the whales. And they did a really good job of hunting the whales. And they killed all the whales. Um, and then they came back in the 17th and 18th century hunting furs. So mainly arctic foxes and seals and walrus and polar bears and reindeer. And they did a really good job of that. And they killed a lot. They killed almost all the seals, which was hard on them. Polar bears, of course. And then in the very, uh, well, in the 20th century, 
Mr. Long Urbian. He came over there in 1910, the year my grandfather was born, not that long ago. And he discovered um, that it was rich in coal. So they started mining coal. And that's when uh, things really started to heat up for, uh, for, long, um, for long European, of course, but also for Spitsburg and Svalbard. Because um, it was a success. Apparently, now I'm not a geologist, I don't know anything about this, but apparently the coal there is super flaky and brittle. So it can only use it for certain applications. And most of us here don't use that kind of coal. But that was his idea, was to ship it to the East Coast. And um, so I think they did that for a little while, but it wasn't super successful. Uh, but other countries came in. So there were a couple of Russian towns that mined coal. There was a Norwegian town. Um, <laughs> I think there might even have a Swedish one, don't quote me on that. There are a couple of other towns, and each one of those towns, they were company towns, and so they would have their own currency. So you'd have, you know, a Russian currency in one, I guess, I don't know if what it was in Long Year, maybe it was American currency, I don't know. Um, and then you would have Norwegian currency in another. So they're like little independent city states, right? Um, until the late 20 or middle 20th century, that sort of um, dissolved a little bit. It's still like that now, but they all use uh, Norwegian money because it's sort of regulated by like that, even though they don't. Then um, the, there's still a little bit of coal mining that happens, but not tons. Apparently, there are just a couple of places on the planet that still use this kind of flaky coal. Uh, now, there's a lot of research that goes on there. So that's a 20th, 21st century thing that goes on there. Um, this is an example of one of the coal towns. It's Russian. It's called Pyramidin. And I have several paintings from Pyramidin. Let's see. I don't have any here right now, but I, I have some down in the shop. There are some prints of some of my paintings of Pyramidin. Mm -hmm. Now, you can see the coal chutes up here and across the top where they would mine for coal and bring it down. Now, this town was giant. This was 800 people in this town. And then in 1998, they got a call, everybody out, and they just abandoned the town. It's pretty interesting. I don't know why. I don't know, even know if they even know why. But they said, okay, everybody out, and they left a couple of people there just to kind of watch over things. They keep their foot there because there are some strategic reasons why you might want to have um, a presence in the Arctic. I think it was useful in World War II and a few other things like that. Uh, this, is, this is Sasha. He's Russian. According to my statistical sample of one, all... <laughs> Male Russians are named Sasha. <laughs> and they all wear seal coats yeah. with belts around the middle. <coughs> he was a super nice guy. But I just love the way that he fit into this sort of stereotype, storybook version. Um, and this is one of our crew members. Notice that they both have guns. Why would they have guns? Polar bears. Polar bears, yeah. So anytime you are, well, really anytime you're anywhere, even right in the middle of town, you should have a gun. And they have all kinds of warnings out about the polar bears. Polar bears are the only bears which will hunt humans. They don't want to eat us. We're not very tasty. They'd much rather eat seals. But... You know, if they've got a cub or something, who knows? So here we are at Pyramid Inn. I love how even the, the uh, uh, I don't know, I'm not sure what you would call that sort of um, lawn furniture, <laughs> has the hammer and sickle. It's just incredible. Yeah. Mothball. The city. Kids, moms, dads, everybody. The playground. You can see the uh, coal stuff in the back. 
Just a town like any other, right? It just happens to be in the Arctic. You even have a gymnasium with a basketball in here somewhere. Maybe it's in the next photo. There's a basketball. And the, what do you call this, a pommel horse? And in the, in the basketball court, there's even like the score of the last game. <laughs> like, it was like Sweden versus, no, it was Norway versus Russia. <laughs> like the two towns would play each other. It's fantastic. There was even a film in the cinema camera. They had a cinema, they had a gym, like a YMCA kind of thing. Then there is um, New Elsend. Now, New Elsend is, this painting is of New Elsend back here. I hope you get to come up and have a look. Um, that's based on New Elsend, the red one. Um, and a few others. New Ilsen, I'm told, means New Eels Land in Norwegian. Does anybody here speak Norwegian? Or pronounce it? New Eels Land. It is the northernmost non-military habitated, habited, inhabited place on the planet. Mm -hmm. I saw Sam. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is where a lot of the research happens uh, for, like, what's the deal with the ozone, what's the deal with climate change, is there lead in the atmosphere, all that kind of stuff happens here. And uh, lots of different countries have um, a research facility there, and they have their little flag out front. And it's, it's, there are people there year-round. It's only about, I think, 20 to 30 people there in the winter. Um, and I think it's technically still a company town. I'm not sure how that works exactly. Um, very interesting. This is a weather balloon. We were very lucky to see an actual real life weather balloon. What this was is, this is a 35 pound box, which is attached to the weather balloon. And then it flies up, it measures whatever it measures. And then eventually the balloon pops and lands. And they try to find these boxes, but there's probably a lot of these boxes around the place. <laughs> so, <laughs> no. When aliens come, they're going to think we're very <laughs> Then there's the Global Seed Vault. You may have seen this in movies. It's popped up in a few movies. Um, the Global Seed Vault is in um, Longyearbyen. And uh, I asked to go there. I had, I had heard about it for, for years with some of my environmental work. And so I asked our resident, this gal that was looking after us. Incidentally, this gal that was looking after us, Sarah. She was amazing. Do you know, she lives year-round in Longyearbyen. And do you know where she lives? In the campground. Whoa. She is one tough cookie. <laughs> Like, no creature comforts for her, man. And she had never heard of this place. So we found, yeah, which is also kind of incredible. Um, so anyway, we found it. And um, I, I knew this going in, but I just wanted to look at it. That no people are allowed in. Because it's the whole idea is to pr take samples of all the different seeds from all the different plants in the world and put them in this underground vault in case there's some kind of a big catastrophe. Um, so nobody's allowed in. So we, we drive as close as we can, and there's this big parking lot. <laughs> but of course it's closed. And we're like, that's ironic. Nobody's allowed in, so why is there a parking lot? <laughs> anyway, city planning, I guess. Well, how do they get the seeds in there, though? Well, there are doors. People, yeah. If you have the right kind of badge, I'm sure you can. Suit. Yeah, I'm sure if they have some kind of a sterile suit with the little things that go over your feet and <laughs> all that stuff. Have you ever worn one of those sterile suits? I got to wear one of those a couple times. Yeah, yeah it's really funny. Well, it's sterile. <laughs> um, right. Now a little bit about, so that was the humans. Now let's talk about nature's inhabitants. The original residents. Uh, this is one of my photographs. This is our ship, which incidentally is called the Antigua. 
There were walruses, birds, polar bears, arctic foxes, reindeers, and of course Santa. <laughs> Even they're abstract. <laughs> Despite the fact that they're like 2,000 pounds, they're really sweet. You know, you, they, they're, not, they're not scared of humans. They haven't been taught, I guess, to be scared of humans. So you could, not that you would, but you could walk up to them. And they are, they smell like cows. They smell like what? They smell like cows. Oh. Smell like a farmyard. Yeah. Mm. Wonderful. It's my new favorite animal. Mm. I love these guys. <clears throat> so I would sketch and take uh, a hike and take photographs. Um, that sketchbook is this one here. So feel free to look through there. <clears throat> You can do some pretty basic sketches with three pairs of gloves on, <laughs> but at least you're comfortable. I hope, by the way, there should be um, four sketchbooks out and also um, a guest book. Some of you might not have heard that. Um, if you are interested in finding out about any other um, events that I'm involved with, um, then, then by all means put your email in the guest book. If you're not interested, just put your name. I'd just like to know who was here, and I won't bother you. But if I do bother you, it would only be like twice a year. It's not, it's not like a lot. It's not, it's not like um, Starbucks, right? Starbucks, they email me like every seven minutes. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Yeah? Uh, what was it like breathing there? Like, you know, it was like being up in the mountains, or obviously it was really cold, but uh, uh, was it like altitude or what? Yeah, there was, there was um, some altitude, but yeah, I think it was more like Winnipeg. You know, it's just, just really cold, really, really, really cold. Um, it hurt a little bit, but it wasn't, I think the coldest would be sort of March or February. Did you acclimate to it? Yeah, I did. I did acclimate to it, um, surprisingly. Because like in my house, when it dips below 70, I'm putting a sweater on it. <laughs> But you're also you're also you're working a lot. You're you know you're really like every step. It's like it's like walking on the moon, as I would imagine. Um, every step is is a bit of a labor. And how long were you there? A month. So, <laughs> sometimes drastic measures were taken to keep warm. I did a lot of squats. I did a lot of push-ups. <laughs> This is one of the sketches from the sketchbook. Um, and you'll see the painting that I did of that sketch on this back wall as well. And there are prints of it downstairs. This is another sketch from my sketchbook. So sometimes I would um, look at something really close. What that is, is I was walking along and Mother Nature, she freezes these rocks and they split open. And this one somehow got spread out and then covered with snow. So that's actually fairly realistic. It looks like an abstract painting, but it's actually a fairly realistic ren rendering of what I saw. How big is it? How big is the image or how big is the actual the thing? The rock. How big was the rock? The rock was about that big. Not that big. Just a little rock. Split. There were split rocks everywhere. And also the um, some of the flora I didn't really talk about the flora too much. But some of them are very similar to what we have in our own mountains here. Because the, I don't know if you guys know this, but the poles are deserts. The poles are deserts. It's just that, so there isn't much precipitation. It's just that it doesn't melt. It doesn't go anywhere. Right? There's permafrost. So the, this, the top level layer of, of soil is liquid. And then everything below that is frozen. So it means that you can't you can't have a foundation, right? Because that it goes mm, and the house goes mom, right? So everything is sort of different. Like you can't have your gas pipes under underground. You can't have your of course you can't be floating. 
Well, it's not floaty. It's like um, just sort of shifts, like sand. Kind so of what like. was the floor? What was the floor? Um, sassafras. There are trees which are this high. That's as high as they get. But they're still technically trees. Do not ask me why. They're still <laughs> technically trees. I don't think they look like trees. <laughs> um, lots of grasses in the summer that just like explodes, just like um, you know Alaska or someplace. Like mountains. So these are sketches done there. Mountains, more mountains. Pyramidin. That Russian town. Here's some of the sassafras. Trying desperately to survive. More abstract landscape. This is a photograph. So finding my voice in that. This is the, the kind of thing I normally create, right? So that is to uh, compare. This painting is here in this room, and this is Mozambique, right? So it's very much inspired by what I saw. It's actually a police boat up on stilts, a reflection of a police boat up on stilts in this, um, I wouldn't call it a marina because there were no pleasure boat. It was just uh, trawlers and stuff. So it was very oily. But it's very much inspired by the clothing that the ladies wore. Are your colors usually pretty true to what they were, or do you just do your own imagination with the colors? Like the ones, the gold I'm seeing in this Arctic, that patch of gold and otherwise white snow and, and blue water. Yeah, that's an excellent question. There's no usually, you're right, that gold is from my head. And your hat? My head. Oh, your head? That's very much from my head. Oh, okay. yes. That gold's from my head. Okay. Um, but this image of the Brooklyn Bridge is fairly faithful, actually. Okay. It is. Um, and then that real brightly colored one that has like that. This one. Yeah. yeah. It's actually fairly faithful. Really. Okay. But with a little bit of um, fabric ideas going in. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. We're just wrapping up here. Um, this is another, this is from the Phoenicia. So this is a painting in Syria. This is a reflection of the, of the sail. And this painting is on the back wall. Rain, Oslo. There's, there are prints available of this one downstairs. So, also to answer your question, this was going to be fully realistic, and then I got this far, and I really liked that pinky color. I just thought, oh, that really works with the blue. And that, that's hard to do, because you have this vision in your head, and then you have what's on the canvas, and they talk to each other. Like, oh, I should finish it. Oh, but that looks good. Oh, I should finish it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this painting's on the side wall. This is New Ailsund. New what? New Ailsund, the northern, that northernmost settlement on the planet. So in that one, is the red from your head, or is that? That's Santa's jacket. <laughs> 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 no, it's a. Uh, it's actually a. There was a red vessel. I think it might have been a post ship. They would get post once a week. Mail. The heart is very easy to see in that one. Uh, yeah. And then this is my most recent painting, which is this one here, yeah. which is all about the Arctic. I have a lot more stories, a lot more stories.